Welcome, everybody. This is session five of our Year of the Artist Big Picture Overview launch. Uh, and we're getting ready for 2022-23, which is going to be the Year of the Artist in Roanoke, Virginia. And we are, we're guiding these conversations, are being guided by um, artists at the Community Development Table, which is a program of Americans for the Arts. And it's, you know, kind of very loose conversations. I have really enjoyed the conversation so far and connecting with everybody. And let's see here, yep, it did work. And just as an overview, we have, um, let's see, I'm gonna make everybody smaller so I can see this. Okay, we've had five sessions, or this is our fifth session. The first, we did a kickoff. Uh, we talked about building a learning community. And then we talked about the artists at the table and in the community and what it means to engage. And then looked at the artist as leader. We talked about agency and how um, the artist at the table can be one to invite others to the table, uh, look at things in a different way. And then we talked about building partnerships and collaborations last week. And this week we're focused on assets and resources. And let's see. Okay. Uh, we are going to do what we normally do. We'll call for any inspiration, reflections, or learnings over the past week. And then we will talk about asset based community development and uh, seven capitals which is going to be fun, I think. I think these things are fun. Uh, then we're going to talk about our, some opportunities and calls. We've got several that we'll review tonight, uh, new ones. And then we'll catch up, do a little Q&A, and we'll be done. We hope to finish within an hour. And our quote, I, I decided I really like these quotes. Um, this one, I'm not sure where I found it, uh, but uh, Margaret Wheatley has been around for a long time and she does organizational development. And I bet a lot of you have, have encountered her um, in, a, in different ways. Uh, this quote is, there is no power for change greater than a community discovering what it cares about. Which rang kind of true for me. I said, well, let me check in and see what she's up to now. And on her website, margaretwheatley.com, <laughs> I was preparing this, but I went down a few rabbit holes and watched a few videos, and there were some terrific ones. And she has a lot of great stuff to say. Um, and she has it on her website. It says current thinking. And they're all from 2020, 2021. And there's some really good stuff there. Um, if you like thinking about how we work together, how we are in the world, um, how we can do even, even better. And again, the Year of the Artist, we're advancing community goals, integrating artists in civic problem solving, exploring, exploring and experimenting. We're paying artists, strengthening the network of artists in the Roanoke area. Uh, we're connecting with each other and we're doing it virtually right now, but eventually and soon we'll be doing it in person and we'll be having fun uh, and playing. And that was one of the first quotes we, we heard. We heard how important it is to play when we're learning together. And we are building a learning community um, and trying to do it really intentionally. Uh, so let me open it up. And if you want to, uh, you can wave at me or you can use the remote wave your hand button. And we're a little bit smaller group tonight. We've got 27 on right now. Um, if you want to, if you have anything you want to, you've reflected on over the past week, and it could be anything from any of the sessions or just something that struck you that you want to share. These, one of these quotes might be from you. All right, Richard. Yeah, I just want to um, thank Liz Stallings for talking to us last week about the Bent Mountain Center. Uh, and I would say that if you have an interest and you haven't reached out to Liz, you should do that. Uh, so I reached out to her and, uh, and had a great conversation and, and we're working on some, some, uh, some great stuff. So a um, really neat opportunity, if you're interested, that, that gives you that opportunity to reach out to, uh, to find out what's going on in the community. Excellent. Yeah, I think that's a, a, a great example of the ways we can work together across communities, you know, it doesn't have to be right in the city of Roanoke, certainly. Um, and I'm, I'm I can't wait to get up there and maybe take a class or do something fun uh, at Bet Mountain Center. All right, any, um, anyone else? Oh, let's see, Lucy. 
Hi, I'm Lucy. Uh, I just wanted to share it. So I've been going to these since the they started on Zoom, and I've just been really inspired by listening to all of y'all. I've been in an art rut, like stuck in my regular job that has nothing artistic about it. And so I've been doing a lot more art lately. So I just, I appreciate all of y'all and really inspired me to just get back into it. <laughs> Fantastic. That's all I had to say. Yeah, that's, that's also, I saw Kyle threw some hands up there. I'll throw mine up there too. I do yeah. Too. I can't. Hey, and then Susan. I just wanted to mention, you know, when we're talking about how um, artists can help in conflict, what I think you guys might forget is that true artists can see things that aren't already there, you know, solutions that aren't already there. When you're designing and drawing things, you envision something that a lot of people can't envision. So you're more outside the box thinkers than you may think you are. Um, and I think that brings something important to the community. Uh, thank you, Susan. That's a, a great comment. And it's, you know, you only, I mean, you know how you think. You're used to how you think. Uh, and it's hard to, to kind of you know, really realize how how unique it is and how important that unique voice might be at the table. Yeah, Catherine. Well, all right. Can you hear me? Yep. All right. So I guess I just really want to you know make sure that we don't lose the the focus of the bigger creative community because I have been teaching art for so long and I always have to get over this obstacle where people think of artists in a very narrow way, like you do this, you draw. If you don't draw, you're not an artist. You know, if you're not making dimensional things or pictures. So I've been a, really delighted to have had lots of wonderful creative experiences in this community. And I really want to continue. So anyhow, I wanted to kind of like really stress that, that it's not, that being a creative person is a not just that one thing. And that's just a cultural thing that we have, this idea of the artist. So anyhow, I was reading Benet Brown, Daring Greatly, and she has this list of what it means to be wholehearted. And I thought this just struck me as when we're looking at wellness in the community, how artists can be part of that. And she has this one, she has all this, she has a list and I'm gonna go down the list, but there's 10 things of what she discovered from all of her work, what it takes to be wholehearted. And one of the ones that really struck out, stuck out to me was cultivating creativity letting go of comparison. And that just really, really meant a lot to me because so many people feel like, well, I can't do that or I'm not as good as that person. And they don't get inspired by what the people that they see do, but they feel less than. So letting go of comparison and feeling creative, I just thought that was like, yes. So I just want to share that. Terrific. Thank you, Catherine. And uh, last week, some, some folks lingered on after the, after the call. We had more conversation about, about this as well. Pa Polly. Oh, you're, you're on mute. Old lady. Um, I just wanted to say that I went to the Facebook page. And from one of the things that came up from it was Brian Cunahan and, um, and Ralph at the art rat studios offering an art parade at some point and when I said oh I think there's a lot of people yearning for opportunities to be creative together and and short events are kind of fun for that to meet people and um, he said well send people my way so I'm telling everybody here and then I also feel like I want to mention that um, the weaving on the fence is going to be coming down and I was hoping to have some creative wild way of doing that because that wasn't the focus at the beginning. The creation, of course, is always usually more fun. <laughs> and um, so I, I, I thought I might put that out there. I meant to talk to you first, Doug, but anyway, I'll mention it now. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned it. In fact, I almost put a picture of that up in the slide today. It would, I put a newsletter out today or early this morning, and you probably saw a picture of Polly's weaving on the fence. What a fantastic project that was. Um, I, 
I, it's, I think it's beautiful. It's surprising. We look at that chain link fence in a different way now. She had so many different people, kinds of people, ages of people engaged in doing it. She did it over a long period of time. Um, but but the, the, the impetus of it was this great festival that BJ Lark pulled together with Community Arts Reach, um, you know, really to stress the role of the arts and community neighborhood wellness and, and neighborhood vitality. Um, but great project. If you haven't seen it in Wasina Park, um, head over there and, and see it before it's gone and check it, check out that, you know, and we'll hear from Polly more, maybe an opportunity for how we might be able to help her take that down um, before the ball season gets going again. And then uh, Catherine, is your, did you have something else to say or? Okay, okay, all right. So with that, let's um, let's roll right along. Okay, asset-based community development. It's not like it's four words. It's long. It sounds kind of technical, but asset-based community development. It's, it's what it sounds like, right? So when you're working on building your community and you're doing it from the assets you have at hand, and so let's ask the question. You know, what are some assets that a neighborhood or a community might have at hand? What are some assets that a neighborhood or community might have at hand? And feel free to type these in the chat. And while you're doing that, I'll point out that, um, well, and we're gonna talk about Kyle, we'll talk about that in just a little bit. Um, okay, people power. So people in the neighborhood, a library. People, a library, the skills of the people, the parks. A blank space for mural, a space on a wall. Yeah. So we, terrific. Well, library, people. So we've got institutions, we've got spaces, wealth of materials, old junk lying around, outdoor venues, donors. Yeah. People, people who might be willing to contribute and might really be, appreciate being asked to contribute. Churches. Yes. Vacant storefronts, window exhibition space, skills and advice. All right. Well, that's a that's, see that was very quick. Businesses. So that was, that was very quick, but we got a good a good list of of assets. Um, when we th assets are so much. No one no one mentioned it. well the donor. Someone did say donor, so that that leads to money. But it is so much more than money. Um, and I've worked on projects. We did this, I designed this program called Rally, where we work with communities and, and, and they always end up being arts projects. We give them very little bit of money. And it always turns out that they could have done the project without the money, really. It's never, they never come back and say, we can't do it with only $3,000. We, we need more money. They often say, oh, we not only did our project that we said we were going to do, but we did these other four things as well. And really, it was a matter of organizing their assets uh, and, and taking advantage of them, um, putting them to work. And one of, the, uh, one of the activities that I'll do with the group focuses on seven capitals. And this was done by Cornelia and Jan Flora not that long ago, really. They were doing agricultural economic development, um, entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial ecosystems, and working with communities to say, OK, um, you're a rural community. We know you know you don't have access to a whole lot of money. You don't have the corporate foundations that many communities do. You don't have the big donors. But what do you have? And as a way to help them list the assets they had at hand, they put out some categories. And those seven categories are kind of helpful. You see, we touched on a bunch of them already. So uh, let's see. So the natural capital, the parks, the cultural capital the, could be the library, the things that happen in the library. Libraries also built capital. So the buildings there, the, the wall space that you can paint a mural on, that's built capital. Financial capital can be those the, don the donors that you have access to. Uh, so political capital. Yeah, there might be. So political capital could be access to the mayor in the community if the... Um, if your neighborhood has the mayor's ear, okay, there's some political capital. Uh, or if they've got, um, you know, if they've got an organized 
a neighborhood association or a church, when we mentioned churches, that social capital, those things that connect us, that, that glue between us is really critical. Uh, and if we have that, we, we can do a whole lot. Now, just the fact that someone's in a neighborhood or in a community and you're and people who live there are listing out the things that they've got and start to think about how they can connect them in order to make things happen. Even that is building social capital. Um, you know, the neighborhood, we have, have a long history of neighborhoods in Roanoke and active neighborhoods. And of course, during the pandemic, it's been tough to get people together um, in the neighborhoods. In some cases, aren't as strong as they were before, um, but I'm sure if we start to do some projects in, in the neighborhoods and um, engage residents, let them contribute, um, they can, you know, if neighbor, a leader in the neighborhood wants to like drive a project, um, that can be, a, you know, these, these capitals, uh, they're out there. Some of them we can build even in the fact, even in the process of doing, doing a project. And we might say, hey, there's no, there's no, um, uh, there's no um, financial capital here, but once we start digging, we might find that there is. So the human capital is those skills that you mentioned. Also, the access to, to things that strengthen those skills are included in that. So if there are programs like um, programs that workforce development programs, uh, community college programs, um, et cetera, even a training program that the city puts together, the leadership college, you know, those things contribute to human capital as well. So I've got a link and I'll, I'll include these links. There's a nice little paper that kind of pulls all this together that Purdue University did. So we'll put that link in our, in our resources page. And let's see, I think you're still seeing what I'm seeing. Are you seeing a green, a green cover? Okay. So this is from the 90s, from the early 90s. And I did a, a degree in, in California and kind of it's, it was in planning and community development. And um, th this was kind of like our Bible then. And it is still very much uh, very well regarded. Um, Kretzmann and McKnight's building communities from the inside out and the way they first de defined asset based community development. Of course, it's asset based, not need based. We have a history and we do it over and over again of saying, okay, we need resources for this neighborhood or this community or this region. So let's show everybody how bad the picture is. And we just paint this picture of need. And here's why they need everything. And here's, here's the data on it. And that can be pretty hard for a community to only see itself that way, especially when outsiders are talking about the community in that way. And of course, when we focus that much and we saw what happened, what we know what happens when um, the, the rich social network is not valued in a neighborhood. Uh, we know in our community here what, what happens. Um, and the, and the, that term blight can be applied to things that aren't understood if you don't go, go more deeply into it. And um, so that's a, a dark part of our history in Roanoke. So asset-based community development taps those individuals, the associations, the institutions, builds from, builds from that, helps them build. The uh, kind of, you know, and the connections between them. Um, who is, who's part of a church group? Who is part of, uh, who's active at the library? Um, if you can, can map that, and it can even end up looking like a physical map where you have things on a board and you can, take string and connect it, you know, written, connect one thing to the other. And you see this web. Um, and the, the, the stronger that web is, you know, the more lines there are, the stronger that, that network can be across those assets. And the cool thing too is sometimes you'll see some that aren't connected. And you'll say, wow, well, these two things have, ne have never been in business together. They've never partnered. And I've used in business in kind of a very loose way. Um, what would happen if we took these two and connected them? Who knows? So asset-based community development you know, reaches for those non-traditional partnerships. And of course, of course, of course, we talk a lot about relationships. It's relationship driven. Uh, and then uh, the goal, of course, is to align and align 
elements in the community, the assets in the community, and then and mobilize and them, help them mobilize. All right, so that's asset-based community development. Now, and the first thing, I think the very first thing you listened to was people power. And so we got the power of people here in the title of this slide. Again, there's networks and connections. The personal experiences, you heard uh, VJ say, my, she said, I think her, her phrase, she said, uh, my lived experience, um, that is an asset. And that's another asset that has been over, overlooked. Um, and people tend to regard the expert often from someone, someone who is outside the community who perhaps has a degree, um, but the expert and expertise is they are in the community uh, from those their personal experiences. Um, and when that can be shared, that's really powerful. Of course, it has to be chosen to be, to be shared. Um, oops. Let's see, I was, I was trying to get access to my, to my words. Those hub people. Um, and you when, you're, when you start mapping things out, you might see that there is a hub person that has lots of lines to that, to, to he, she, or they. And um, that's, a real, that's a real powerful, powerful thing. Um, some people are just built that way. They know what's happening. They um, enjoy connecting people. Um, they enjoy helping people, um, you know, providing access to resources. And those are often you know, hub people. And that hub person, if you are going to work on a project and you think it, um, and you've built relationships in a, in a neighborhood or a community uh, or within an organization, um, and it might be that a hub person has reached out to you and said, hey, you know, I've seen you've been here at our meetings, you know, how about doing something? I can help you. I can invite you in. I can help you make these connections. Um, and then the word, the term social capital, um, all of this really ties, builds to social capital. And Robert Putnam was, was the, the one who, who really talked about that in the 90s, uh, you know, based on work he had done in uh, first in, in Italy and then other than here in the United States and focused on exactly these, these things. So there's associations, the institutions, the things that we might say aren't that important, like in his, the book was Bowling Alone, and that was the title of it. He showed how we had fewer people bowling together in leagues, and is that something that would worry us? You know, if we have fewer people who are signing up for uh, um, a service club, if we have fewer people who are going to church, um, you know, these networks, are they diminishing because of that, or are they being replaced by other kinds of institutions? Are we doing things in a different, different way now? And that's a, that's a question that's worth, worth exploring. And again, with that power of people, you have to ask these kinds of questions. So who has been overlooked? What gifts are we not tapping? And then who do we think is not worthy as a contributor? And I put in there, who do we act like we think is not worthy as a contributor. Because of course, you, you, know, you ask anybody to say, oh no, everyone has something to contribute. But sometimes we should, we, if we look at what we're doing, honestly, we catch ourselves and say, well, you know what? We didn't extend that deeper invitation to, to someone. We just put it out on, you know, on an email. But did we, you know, we know this person isn't on email. Someone mentioned it last week. Not everybody uses this technology. Um, if, if we had gone, if we knocked on the door and said hello and introduced ourselves, or if we had called, um, or if we had, um, you know, made the made the effort to go to the church, perhaps where we know that person, or there, there are people who aren't, you know, in those, you know, who aren't um, online or on social media, um, you know, that invitation is showing that we we think they are worthy as a contributor. So. Who do we act like we think is not worthy as a contributor? And that's not, you know, often not intentional. We're trying to do things so fast. We know we're trying to do things so fast. Um, but again, we, and this is the lesson I tell myself a lot, you know, slow down, focus on the process. Process is as, as important or sometimes more important than the product. And let's see if we can do this in a different, different way. Now, power distance is really, we've talked, this is just another way of talking about agency in a way. Um, 
and the definition here, the extent to which the less powerful accept and expect that powerful is unequal. So if you don't have a sense of agency, it's a different, just kind of a different way of saying it. Um, you expect that you don't have power and that the power is un, unequal. And part of my reflections have been that this can, you know, there are lots of people who, who, who really feel of the power imbalance. And it can be residents in a community, it can be organizations in a community who feel they don't have access. Um, and, you know, it can be an artist, you know, and it, it could be, you know, there are lots of, we talked a little bit about the things last things, the last time we talked a little bit about the things that happen to you in your life and how they make you think and how they make you, you know, perceive yourself. And um, it's just kind of, kind of natural. So if someone says, if someone is, has been dismissive and says, hey, oh, you're just an artist, you're, just, you're creative, you're, you think differently. So you're over here on this side of the room and we're going to do the work over here on this side of the room because this is fill in the blank this is business this is science this is you know um you you name it so the, the power distance and so here's our next question what do you think creates a power distance and you can use the chat or you can raise your hand i'm happy with with either one or both so what do you think might create the sense of a power distance? Oh, hey, Kyle. Oh, you're on you're on mute. Uh power distance is maybe not having the information. That not having not having the information not knowing because mm -hmm. those who know what's going on are going to have more power than those who do not are not aware yeah yep yep so we talk a lot about transparency and how decisions are made and the space they're made in why they're being made if that information isn't communicated it can certainly create power distance yeah Any, any other thoughts? Jane. Accessibility. Say a little bit more about that. Uh, well, you know, I was just, I'm jotting notes like crazy and I'm like, where are the RA calls in other languages? Or where can somebody access hearing it if they can't read it? You, you know what I'm saying? So those issues definitely create a gulf. Yeah, yeah. So ability, and we're you know, and we need to we need to get better about that. You know, and, and like there are rules about our website. You know how we make our website available. These things are really helping now. So when we do put them up on YouTube, you know, if you're if if you can't hear, you can read the subtitles, which is helpful. But you'll find now, and like most um, National Endowment for the Arts programs, they'll they will explain they'll, they'll they'll visualize it for people. So before I started to talk, I would say, my name's Douglas Jackson, um, middle-aged man with curly red hair. I'm wearing a blue shirt. Um, so that someone has a, a more full experience if they are just listening. Um, but yeah, D Jane, thank you. And we need to do a better job with that as well. Heather. Um, I had put this in the chat too, but I think um, connections to people can shift the power balance because there's definitely in certain communities, you're going to have a hard time getting anywhere or engaging that community if you're not connected to the leaders that then can lead you deeper into that community. And there's a lot of trust that has to be built there. So um, I think that's another thing that can, can create a power distance. Thank you. Yeah, the connections to people. Simone said difference. Jane said history. Catherine said money. Um, yeah, yeah, all of these, all, all of these can create a difference um, and distance. And if you think about, um, like language 
acknowledging biases and old hierarchy model methods. Polly, you want to say a little bit more about that? <laughs> no, okay. <laughs> Guess that's what I feel like a lot of Roanokers or people around the country have been um, invited to do and, and have committed themselves ourselves to looking at our personal biases and our community um, structures and old systems and ways of doing things that um, you know felt comfortable and powerful and um, appropriate to some in the past, but that we have to realize now in any sector, you know, how do we make these decisions and how, you know, how can we then re reassess the accessibility and um, empowerment of others? Yeah, and that, um, there's, a, there's a whole lot, a whole lot there. Um, and if we are, you know, willing to question and a lot of things I think people would say, oh, it's, well, it's, the, it's efficient. We've always done it this way. Um, and that shortcut of always having done it this way, if we don't question it, there, there certainly can be people who are being left out um, and, and it's easy and possible to not see that as a, as a, as a power issue. Um, if you don't look at it and, and question it. Age, we rarely engage young people under 18. Yeah, thank you, Catherine. Um, okay, so what, what can you do? What is, we've start, talked about some other things, but to what can we do to lessen it, the, the power distance? So you talked about um, increasing access by putting out things in different languages about questioning the way we're doing things. Um, language too, you know, can be created distance, especially like jargon, jargon language. Yeah, you want to talk a little, Liz, you want to say something or ask a question about, about art age and teens? Um, I, I, um, I would love to talk more with Catherine or anyone else oh. about teens and art, um, just engaging teens in general. I was having a talk with a, a local establishment in Floyd who was thinking to add like a teen night where we could drop off our kids and they would engage in activities. We're not there because they don't want us there. They need us desperately, but they don't want us anywhere near them. And we want them um, to be experiencing arts and culture and other things, I mean, if besides this thing, right? And so I'm baffled and I'd love to help to, to find solutions. It may take trying to get our teens to tell them what it is that they would like to do in that regards too. So great, open. Yeah, I'm curious. Excellent. Thanks, Liz. Um, and Susan said, uh, warm introductions to us by us to people in the know or people in the community. So yeah, we talked about that hub person. Um, you know, if you are a, if you like being a hub person, if you like connecting people, Nobody appoints you in that position. You just assume it. Just take it. Just take it on, um, and it, it makes a it makes a huge huge difference. All right. Let's see. Okay. Well, that was that was the end of our of our conversation tonight. We're, we'll continue as we as we go, and we'll come back and hit some questions. But we'll continue um, after. We hit the 7.30 mark, you know, people link, want to linger and go a little bit deeper, we can do that as well in a very informal way. Now, uh, we've got some uh, kind of uh, announcements and things that we can do to, to, um, to continue providing opportunities. Now, one thing I want to um, rem remind everybody about is there'll be a celebration of the arts called Arts Pop, and that is going to be on March 4th through 6th at the Taubman Museum of Art. And it'll be Friday night, it'll be Saturday, and it'll be Sunday. And there's some great events happening. Um, Kyle. Um, I will be there on Sunday drawing caricatures. So 
and free, 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 free. And I don't mean the commercial, all right? And just to get to Catherine Divine, bless her heart for saying to have that broader umbrella of the arts. I consider caricature a spectator sport. I need your support. I'm politicking for your support. And, uh, you know, my goal is to draw every artist in Roanoke so that you can be as famous as I am. That's all definitely tongue in cheek. Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, excellent. And Kyle is Kyle's very thoughtful about the work that she does and the and the the, the power of it and helping to form groups and to engage people um, and not just the people who are sitting for a caricature, but the people who are around. Um, so I look forward I look forward to seeing you on Sunday. Then Susan, Kyle, what time? Oh, you got it on mute. Sunday is like one to four and they've given me two hours, but uh, once I found out it was all part of demonstrating the arts, I'll probably get there early and just stay the duration, but don't tell them that, okay? Mom's a word. And, uh, and I'll be there and I'll, I'll have a mask on, so I'll look like this. Okay, so but but say everyone, say everyone should get their souvenir mask caricature. <laughs> it's <Yeah>. historical. <laughs> it is. It is. Okay, so that so that's happening. I keep talking about that because we're we're really trying to do a lot to um, pull together and market and celebrate the arts. Um, you know, Roanoke has always been kind of an arts capital on the western side of the state. Um, we have lots of art capitals now. There's a whole 81 corridor of wonderful communities, in Harrisonburg and Stanton. Uh, I, I'm not, I don't want to list them all because I'll leave some out. Blacks, you know, Blacksburg has got the Moss Center and lots, you know, all those young people down there, all kinds of artists and lots of things happening. Down all the way down to um, Abingdon, Radford, Withful. There are lots of great things happening. Um, we want to, I think it's important that we keep celebrating and pulling together um, our arts to tell a story about what they're doing in the community. And that's part of what we're doing with Roanoke Arts Pop. It's very intentional. And we, in fact, tomorrow night at seven o'clock, we're doing two Buzz for Good episodes about the collective of um, arts and cultural organizations participating in the Arts Pop. Um, the first one will be before the Arts Pop and the second one will catch up and have there'll be footage from the Arts Pop and people talking about the role of the arts in their lives and such. So, Susan, did you have a, a question or comment? Okay. So, um, so tomorrow night at seven o'clock, that'll be on Blue Ridge Public Television. And this is the first of a series. In fact, we're using some um, American Rescue Act dollars to fund these. Uh, and so there'll be a series, a session on arts and, and health, and there'll be an episode on arts and education. Um, so we'll do six of these over the course of the year. And I believe it is going to help us demonstrate to ourselves what our kind of value proposition is for the arts in Roanoke as we talk to ourselves and we talk as we talk in the community and as we speak more broadly to the world beyond. All right. And then uh, here is an opportunity. Um, Kyle, do you want to talk about uh, so the Soulbox project? Absolutely. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to try to be brief, but everything that uh, this uh, Year of the Artist has led to um, uh, really kind of dovetails with what I've been doing in the community. So um, I am on a subcommittee for the Gun Violence Prevention uh, Council. And of course, I like my main medium is a Crayola marker. So sometimes I wonder how as a artist I got on, on this committee, but there you go. But I am well connected because I, I, my art is very outside of the studio. So um, I wanna give you the opportunity to have the boots on the ground. I went to the Loudon Melrose uh, Neighborhood Association meeting and it was very, very enlightening to me about their problems that they confront. Uh, since 2017, there has been over um, 4,629 
instances of uh, gun violence right here in our community. And part of what I thought this group was going to do was collaborate together with nonprofits to uh, do that. And Soulbox Project is a national organization. They had over 200,000 origami, uh, personally made little uh, boxes up on the National Mall. And you need to go to the website and see it. It just blows your mind of personal stories of the gun violence. Um, just today, my uh, high school intern assistant, uh, you know, she's the one I get a lot of information from because she's in high school, I get her perspective. Just today, there was a, a kid who brought a gun into school in one of the high schools here and they had a lockdown. Um, uh, the issue of getting our kids involved is very, very important. And it's important also that we not give them a negative way to do that. So on March 3rd, and it's in the chat, uh, there is a workshop in Lynchburg that has already created a soul box project event. And I'm going to go there and I would love to have some company. If somebody wants to come up and go up there a little early, I don't have a schedule yet. I think there's an Andy Warhol uh, exhibit at the uh, Doris, um, again, at I, Liberty um, Museum. We could go up there a little bit early. Uh, walk the bluff walk and then go to this workshop and see how it's run and then bring it to Roanoke. And I can see down the road how one thing that connects us all and maybe to get involved with the youth is to connect our greenways, which do go does go all the way through the community, have some sort of an event venue that's up against the greenway where we can perform or have gallery shows or things like this that are up. And maybe we need to, uh, if any of you have any connections to a warehouse that's right up against the Greenway. One, if you're on the Greenway jogging or biking with your family, wouldn't it be wonderful to have as a destination an art, you know, let's go to the art gallery. There is a sculpture garden up by Black Dog Salvage, but how many people really recognize that? If we were to have an event like this and to have it close enough where people from every community could come through and see it. It would be absolutely wonderful. So get in touch with me. Um, like I said, if you want to come with me on March 3rd, bring me a cupcake because my birthday is just really close by. And <laughs> well, of course, I'm not going to go up there and be all droll about this because uh, I have learned a lot about what young people do. These people from out of town come in and they see our kids as being sitting ducks. They make friends with them, they give them candy, and then they make the little kids do their running for them, become their best pals. And we've got to find those kids something else to get involved in. And this little art project is just boots on the ground for this group if we could do that. And I think that touches. Um, the art project, uh, the subcommittee I was on, I think all of us should get involved with our neighborhood association as an artist to help them see how they can get involved with other neighborhood groups and see what their issues are and cross pollinate. And then just like me, come back to this group and say, Northeast, and last week or the week before we had that demonstration of Southeast doing the murals. And that's like our boots on the action. It adds value to our own personal art if people see us working on the problems that affect us all and affect those we love and affect those in our thing. So um, one of the gun violence goals was to create a, an, an interactive art project to enable the user to learn about other neighborhoods in the city. That has not really been addressed directly. And I, I, I just challenge your creative minds to contact me and perhaps come up with a way of how neighborhood associations can link with each other artistically and have fun with it and um, help us all feel safe, no matter which of our Roanoke neighborhoods we are driving through or are in. And what connects us all is the joy of the arts, whether it be dance, music, singing, or anything like that. So um, again, my uh, 
I put my contact information in the chat. Uh, Doug has it. It should be in the group emails. And I'll leave go ahead. that go ahead. go ahead and type it in down here at the bottom because it's kind of gets, it gets hard to scroll back up and, and get it. Um, okay. So, yeah, you can go. So, Heather, Kyle's going to type it in there. And Heather, your hand is up. I just want to check and see if you um, had a comment or if it was just lingered up. I think it just, okay, great. Um, thank you, thank you, Kyle. This is uh, tremendously important. Um, I know the, the group's been um, thinking about how to, even prior to the pandemic, I think, or maybe kind of at the beginning of the pandemic, the group's been thinking, okay, now what's the project, what's an art project? going to be. There, um, there are a number of resources now in the community and there's um, uh, Chris Roberts is the, the, the staff lead who's been hired for, um, I know for at least two years, um, he's going to be coordin coordinating efforts. He's doing a lot of listening now. He's sitting with families of, who have um, been affected by gun violence. And he is looking at creating a system um, of these kinds of activities for younger people. And I know he's meeting with faith leaders now and saying, okay, well, you've got a church hall here. Is there a way, you know, is there a way we can use this church hall? Is there a way, how, how can we organize? So he's in that process now. And I've been working with him. Um, he's very interested in how we're connecting the arts. Um, and I think this is going to be a really interesting project. And I, it looks like you're getting some folks who are going to want to um, right along with you to Lynchburg. So I, I'll follow up with you on that too. Wonderful. Um, yeah, in case we need to put out another another note. And there are lots of people who are interested but can't be on tonight and, and we'll be watching this later. Hey, I'll, I'll rent a bus. Oh, we can, we we can, can call it the party bus. And everybody, I, I had to draw on, a, on, a, on a Tanya Tucker's bus in Nashville once to keep people occupied while they drove to her mansion. So anybody who drives with me gets a caricature too, because I can't help myself. Excellent, there's a, there's a bonus. And now um, I do, I'll go on to the next, the next item. Um, oh, I should have, you know what? In fact, let me, I'm gonna go ahead one more and then I'll go back to this one. Um, okay, so the Gun Violence Prevention Commission has resources as well for other projects. Uh, I think that this project, the Soul Box project, is going to push forward and they've got resources. They're going to organize that way. There are other aspects as well that they've got many grants that they're going to be um, putting out. And there's a call tomorrow, if you're interested in that, a webinar on this. And they've got some specific language about it. And it says they will start accepting applications. Um, I'm about to lose everybody. I'm about to put, put, okay. Applications for violence interruption proposals and gun violence prevention commission mini grants focuses on prevention, intervention, and response initiatives. So prevention, intervention, and response in initiatives to reduce gun violence in the community. So that's that's really broad. And so they did a round of mini grants um, last year, and there were a number of, of arts-based engagements as well. So that's another funding, you know, funding source for for a project. Uh, and again, that link is there. Um, I should grab it and put it in the chat. Let me see if I, I think I can do that. Well, maybe I'll do that as we're, let's see. Um, how do I do that? I, okay, I can hit it. I think I can hit escape. Okay. And then, okay, I can grab that. All right, and so then another uh, proposal, downtown Roanoke is interested in talking to local artists who create unique digital designs. So they're, they, you know, there, it says the project's in the early stages, but they're currently gathering information to see what's possible. So I've noticed um, on downtown Roanoke's um, newsletters now, they're nice little loose watercolors that someone has been doing. Um, so I think they're trying to do more with, with arts. Um, I did talk with Tina the other day. She's a big advocate for the arts. And when you talked about the parade, the idea of having an art parade, 
she would be all over it. She's very interested in what we can do to make uh, downtown, especially, you know, and this is the same goal we have for neighborhoods, how we can activate it. She's interested in that kind of fun, the fun, quirky, real aspect of the art that the arts bring. So if you're interested in that, contact uh, Jamie C at downtownroanoke.org. And Jamie is spelled differently. So look at, it's J-A-I-M-E at downtownroanoke.org. So just reach out directly and, and that might be an opportunity. Okay, and then while I said, okay, I pull the chat up. I'm gonna put this, see how I did this? I put that, that's the link for tomorrow night's Zoom meeting. If you uh -huh. wanna do that, if you're interested in the, um, in the gun violence mini, mini grants. And I, I do think we're going to have, I talked to somebody this, this weekend who's looking at the Art Matters grants. I'm, I'm going to send this to him as well, but he was already reaching out to me about that, about an art project um, tied to gun, gun violence. Um, okay. And all right, so we got one, let's see, let's talk about our calls as a reminder. We have the We Are Art the self-portrait call has closed, but we have now all of the applicants and I am putting together a panel and that panel is going to meet probably in the next next week. Uh, we told you that we'd have that out, I believe by March 8th, we'd, we'd let you know uh, how that's going to work. And remember, we're going to pay you $500 and give you until June to come back with a, a portrait of you in the community. And so that's the update on that. We, on our open calls, well, shoot, I gotta, I gotta change this. The Greenway call closed today at two o'clock. Um, so we'll, I'll, uh, we're gonna set up a panel for that as well. And if you're interested in ever serving on a panel, I would, we have to have artists on the panel. It is a requirement. We've gotta have two arts professionals on each panel. Um, so if you're not, if you don't have a proposal in and you wanna see what it's like, uh, hit me up. I'd love to have you um, on a sit in on a panel. Now, of course, right now we'll probably be doing these virtually, um, and each one will be a, a little bit different. Uh, but it is it is fun, I think. And now the Art Matters grants. The first round is due on uh, March eighth, and that's remember that's twenty five thousand dollars. We're going to cap that. Um, and so we're going to we'll have more money coming later, but we're going to do a little bit, and we're going to learn as we do it. So I've already got an application, at least one application has, has come in and it looks like everything works okay on the form. You know, it's always, the first person who fills it out always lets me know what I did wrong on the form. Uh, and then the inspired grants. Uh, we've had our first, oh, let's see, is Aaron? Aaron, are you on the call? E-R-I-N, Aaron? Okay, I don't, I don't think Aaron's on the, on the call, but we did, oh, is she? Oh, Aaron, do you, do you mind talking to us? And if you're not, if you're, and it's okay if you're like me, sometimes I'm eating my dinner, um, you know, I'm, I'm doing four things, fixing, fixing a broken toilet, eating my dinner and trying to listen to a webinar. Uh, <laughs> so if you're, if you're, if you are willing, I invite you to unmute and tell us what you did uh, for your inspired, uh, cultural grant. Let's see, it looks like you're unmuted, but I can't hear anything. So I'll, I'll paraphrase if it's okay. Okay, well, Erin submitted her. Okay, great. Thanks, Erin. I like to get permission for doing it. And Aaron submitted uh, an application and went to see, and I was there on Saturday. And if you haven't gone, well, you, you, you can go during the Roanoke Arts Pop, um, but go to see the Afrofuturism Ruth E. Carter exhibit of the costumes from the films. Uh, it is spectacular. Uh, Aaron and a friend went to see that uh, to get inspired. So we're gonna write a check now for the cost of the two tickets and 20 extra bucks um to to pay for that experience uh and aaron and i aaron thank you so much for a, a sending your sending your tickets and and the comments you made on it it really is i 
I tell you, that show is doing so much in the community. It felt like I was in a bit much bigger city when I was down there on Saturday. It was super diverse group. Um, lots of people really enjoying all of the exhibits and particularly the, um, the Afrofuturism exhibit. So if you haven't gone to it yet, get down there to the Taubman. Um, and I did see the question in the chat, what's an arts pop? And uh, two years ago, the, the Taubman had an exhibit on um, pop art. And so they said, oh, let's do an event. And, you know, cause it's a big, big exhibit. We'll invite all the partners in the community to come down and celebrate. Um, and they called it arts pop and it stuck. So this will be the second time we're doing it. Once was right before the, the pandemic struck and one's right, right after saying that. <laughs> I'm saying it out loud, knocking on wood. Um, and so we, so we hope we're um, going to have it. I think we're going to have a terrific, terrific time there. And it is, it's, it, there will be performances in different galleries. Uh, there's a schedule online. Just, just Google Roanoke Arts Pop and Taubman and it'll come right up. Um, okay, so those are, the call, those are the calls that we have. Go ahead and go out and go to a symphony show or go uh, get some tickets and go out. We've got... Um, yeah, I'll let you know when we start getting down and starting to run out of um, resources. Now, here's our next call. Are you ready for it? Okay. Our next call is going to be uh, the City of Roanoke Artist in Residence Program. And we're really excited about this. Now, we've we released the Art Matters Grants. And I tell you, there's a different, this will kind of help explain the difference. With the Art Matters Grants, you tell us what you're going to do. And we give you money and you do it. And um, so, and we're saying, okay, we can get a whole lot of little projects happening that are gonna be good for the community. And you tell us how they're gonna be good for the community in advancing wellness, justice, and inclusion. Now, the artist in residence is a little bit different. This is gonna be cohort based. So we're gonna bring in nine artists uh, to be kind of embedded in a project uh, where we tell, now, we don't tell you what the project is, but we tell you what the issue is or what the group you're working with is. And you can, you will do an application. It's, I'm not gonna have it out tonight or this week. I'm gonna do it next week. Cause, and we're doing this one in two parts. And so we're gonna, we'll get together again next week. And I hope to have the host of these, um, the people who you'd be working with. If you said, oh, I wanna be an artist in residence. So um, I think we're gonna have nine of them. Um, I've got a, 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 a a list tonight that's tentative. Um, people I've talked to are very excited about it. Uh, everybody I've talked to has, I haven't heard from anybody who said, well, why would you do that? I mean, everybody is like, yes. And then people who are, I was talking to, to one, one person, they're checking now, storm, stormwater. And they said, you know, we did the stormwater inlet murals and we were working on that project together. And that's another call that's going to be coming very soon. So watch for it. Um, we'll do it in a couple of weeks. Um, but when I was talking with them, they said, oh, you know, we're about to do a resiliency plan where we are looking at the effects of climate change and uh, sea level rise and the effects of that it was going to have in, um, in Roanoke and the most affected neighborhoods, uh, wh where are they going to be? And so what would it be like to have this consultant who's going to come in and work in the community uh, and engage the community around the issue? What would it look like to have an artist working with with that him or, him or her or they um, as they're doing this work. Ah, I'm super excited. So let me just tell you the, the details as I see them now. And, um, okay, so they will be aligned with a specific project that advances the city's comprehensive plan. The artist will be paid $500 a month for a year. So that's $6,000 for the artist stipend. Uh, we'll have, you'll have access to the $3,000 project fund. So the idea is you would, um, let's see, you would go in, let's see, is that, okay. That we'd give you some training um, and we'd go deeper in some of the kind of training we're doing now, but we'll do it and we might make it open to all artists, um, but like actually ask it, that people who are doing, doing the, um, the, the artists and residents program that they, that we make sure they participate. We'll ask you, you go in and you listen and you observe, and we'll talk about how to ask good questions and we'll, we'll kind of explore this together. And then you'll um, be able to develop a project and implement it. 
and all that while, and it's not like this is a full-time job. You'll probably go to a meeting a week or something, or you know, you'd be invited. Your host would say, oh, here are the opportunities around this project. Which do you want to take advantage of? So we know it's not a full-time gig. Um, and then we would say we do the cohort training in um, May to August. August to September, we do we let you lead some stakeholder meetings or and do some project development work. Um, I can do, I'm going to do facilitation training, how to have an effective meeting, some of these things. So we can help you build skills if you're, if you're not as comfortable with it, then you develop a project, you get it approved and you've got time to implement it over the course of the year. Um, and then we hope we're going to learn a lot as a network um, as, as we do this. Now here are the, here are the projects as I see them right now. Okay, complete streets team. We have a team in the city that anytime there's something, something is done on um, a street where they repave it or whatnot, the team comes together and says, how are we gonna make this better for pedestrians, for, like, for all uses, not just for automobiles. And we look at the trees that are there, look at opportunity for art. Oops, I got a typo down there, sorry. Um, opportunity for art. Um, it's engineers and transportation people um, and they're really, and it, it's led by Wayne Lefwich, and he's very excited about having somebody who's, who wants to be part of that. You know, project in that could be like mocking something up. It could be saying, okay, let's try something. Um, and, I, and I know that there are some, there are some ideas out there already. Again, we would ask you to do, do some listening, come up with your own project. They don't feed you the project in this. Um, that's part of the, part of the fun is, is you, you coming up. And we'll also ask you to look broadly. Look around the country and see what other, other places are doing as well. So there'll be a little bit of research around it. Neighborhoods of opportunity. Two, um, two neighborhoods where we're organizing to focus on the social determinants of health. Why are lifespans shorter in some neighborhoods than they are in others? Uh, and how do, we, how, do we, how do we fix that? So what would an arts component um, in engaging people in that question um, as we are organizing in neighborhoods? Now for these, we'd really like to have the artist from the neighborhoods. We think that that, 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 that would be a goal. Um, so, we'll, and we'll see you know, who, who applies when we, when we start getting the word out there. Uh, the Gun Violence Prevention Commission will have a, an artist in residence. Uh, the, we're, we're looking at how we create more neighborhood centers, so more, um, more Crystal Springs, more Brandon Villages, more Wasinas. How do we get those all over the city, not just in Southwest? Um, so we, we're, there's gonna be a consultant coming in, working on a plan for that. What would it look, what could, what would an art space engagement project around that vision um, look like? There was gonna be a new park developed in Eureka or Eureka Center or Eureka Park. There's gonna be a new park center, um, uh, community center developed an artist on site uh, in that process. Then um, Roanoke Valley Sister Cities, um, the year of the artist, we're gonna have artists, I know we're planning on our artists coming in from other countries. Um, we've got the, a park, Century Plaza, that's got the Sister City sculptures and we've got an opportunity in that park for a project. So that's another, uh, that's another one. Um, the resiliency plan I mentioned, that's tentative. Um, the Berglund Center, we know the Bergen Center was created as a result of urban renewal. It's there now, uh, and we have neighborhood, the Gainsborough neighborhood right next to it. How do we, how do we, you know, atone? How do we grieve what happened? And how do we uh, make stronger connections with the neighborhood? And how do we move forward together? Um, so that that's going to be a really interesting one. So there, we're having artists and residents there. We might even hire another artist and residents from outside of the community to come work side by side on that one. And then there's gonna be a network builder slash lead communicator. So somebody who, who might say my art and gift is really connecting people and helping um, take pictures and I can shoot video and I, can, I want to help document this. That network builder slash lead communicator, uh, we'd, get this, we'd get $500 a month for the, um, for the year, so we get $6,000. They wouldn't have a project pool, but we have some resources for marketing. Yeah, Kyle.
and, and you're, you're yes yes I, I was trying to unmute um uh on this artist's potential projects when they when they say it do you have to when you apply do you apply for one of those specific projects or just or you just throw your hat in the ring and they select you so we're going to let you prioritize. We'll let you pick up to three and you'd say one, two, and three. And then we'll look at your preference and choices and try and make it. So it's a match. Um, yeah. But again, I'm not going to have that application out tonight. I'm going to wait and get it out next week. Liz. What is the expected time commitment every month for one of these roles or are they different? I, I think they're going to be different and they'll be different depending on when, when it, you know, the, the project timeline and the, and the, um, the, like the, the, the group that the group that you'd be assigned to, you know, their timeline makes a difference. Plus the project you develop makes a difference. It might be that um, you see a good intensive month where you can do a whole lot of listening, but then it's going to get quiet. So it's not a matter of making sure you're doing something, you know, each month. It's a matter of making sure that you're engaging in a, in a deep way to build relationships and listen, and then, and then getting a project done. So yeah. it's not really a time, it's, it, you know, it, it's not like you'd be punching, punching a clock on it. Got and, it. And part two of the question, does this have anything to do with the, and I might be calling it the wrong thing, but the 2040 plan and starting to incorporate more art into urban planning? It sure does. You know, uh, that's, this is that's cool. a, yeah, this is this is exactly what I applied to the NEA for, and I called it advancing comprehensive plan 2040 or whatever. Um, so our city plan 2040. But then when I went back and looked at it, it seemed a whole lot easier and cleaner. And it made sense to attach an artist where we were already organizing. And rather than say, okay, you're attached to the theme interwoven equity, maybe somebody's attached to neighborhoods of opportunity and the gun violence prevention commission and the Berglund Center. So there's, there's little overlap. So there'll be, it'll be built environment and, um, and uh, interwoven equity, et cetera. So that's, that's exactly what it is that we hope this is doing. And I'm sorry, I've gone a little bit over. We just had so many good opportunities and lots of excitement. Um, but I wanted you to, this is, a, a, this is one I wanted to go a little deeper with next week too, where we can, um, it would be hard to choose one without knowing more about it. So I'm gonna see how many of the folks I can get, in, get on a call. If I can't get them on a call, I'll record one uh, beforehand and we'll, we'll weave it in. So next week, expect to hear more about these, these opportunities. And with that, are there any questions? Any additional questions? Can I ask a question? Sure can, Vicki. Thank you. Um, I just put in the chat, what, what is referenced by the sister cities of Roanoke? What does that mean? Yeah, we are. Yeah, we're part of Sister Cities. It's an international group, uh, and we have seven sister cities. So, Wanju uh, in Korea, Florinopolis in Brazil, uh, Napoli uh, in Poland, um, and we do exchanges. So we'll have a we'll have an artist coming from. Um, well, we, the timing with the pandemic is still kind of up in the air, but there's, there's lots of opportunity for artists to come. We've got, we're hoping to get one from China at some point, although that's the tightest one. Um, we might get one from, we know, you know, we've been talking with Brazil and Rono College is kind of the host for that. The Polish artist, uh, Hollands is the host for it. So I'm going to see if I can get, um, she's, she's offered to come on. Um, uh, Mary Jo Fossier, who's the president of this of the local organizing group for it, and so she'll tell us more about it next week. But okay, great. Yeah. That sounds very exciting. Thank you. Great, great. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? All right. Well, thank you. We appreciate it. I'm going to stop recording, and if you want to hang out and chat a little bit, uh, feel free to. Otherwise, we'll see you next week.